DNS stands for Domain Name System. This is the naming system that maps the entire internet. It associates information with domain names. More specifically, DNS specifies the mappings between numerical IP addresses and domain names. Most engineers know these basic facts about DNS, but they may not know how much engineering a complex company like Etsy or Zappos puts into their DNS configuration. Dynamic DNS allows for intelligent response so that a resource is served from the most efficient place, even in the face of a DDoS attack or just a routine failure of cloud servers. Phil Stanhope is the VP of Technology at Oracle Dyn, and he joins the show to explain how modern DNS works and the role of a DNS provider. Full disclosure, Dyn is a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. For years, when I started building a new app, I would use MongoDB. Now, I use MongoDB Atlas. MongoDB Atlas is the easiest way to use MongoDB in the cloud. It's never been easier to hit the ground running. MongoDB Atlas is the only database as a service from the engineers who built MongoDB. The dashboard is simple and intuitive, but it provides all the functionality that you need. The customer service is staffed by people who can respond to your technical questions about Mongo. With continuous backup, VPC peering, monitoring, and security features, MongoDB Atlas gives you everything you need from MongoDB in an easy-to-use service. And you can forget about needing to patch your Mongo instances and keep it up to date, because Atlas automatically updates its version. Check out mongodb.com slash se daily to get started with MongoDB Atlas and get $10 credit for free. And even if you're already running MongoDB in the cloud, Atlas makes migrating your deployment from another cloud service provider trivial with its live import feature. Get started with a free three node replica set. No credit card is required. As an exclusive offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners, use code SEDAILY for $10 credit when you're ready to scale up. Go to mongodb.com slash SEDAILY to check it out. And thanks to MongoDB for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It means a whole lot to us. Phil Stanhope is a VP of Technology at Dyn. Phil, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having me. So I want this conversation to go in a couple different steps. So first, we'll talk a little bit about DNS and what it means from an engineering point of view. Then we'll walk through some simple examples of how people use it and get to some more advanced, uh, modern, complex infrastructure discussions of how DNS can be useful as a utility. But starting from the beginning, DNS stands for Domain Name System, and this is the naming system that maps the entire internet. It associates information with domain names, and more specifically, DNS specifies the mappings between numerical IP addresses and domain names. So if I'm a software engineer, what are the other fundamentals of DNS that we should all know? DNS is what you just described, a do domain name system, and it's for mapping addresses. Now, there's two uh, address spaces. Uh, so there's the V4 address space that sort of most of us on the Internet have grown up with. Uh, but there's also V6, and they're running concurrently. Uh, and so that's something that you need to consider because uh, some of the very large players on the Internet, they're announcing both V4 and V6 space. And uh, the path that uh, a packet may take over the internet can be very different for v4 versus v6. Uh, so that's one thing to consider at sort of at the network level. Um, and I guess the other thing that I've learned to say, uh, which some people like, you know, it's a bit pedantic, I guess, but is that there isn't an internet. There's millions of internets uh, in both v4 space and in v6 space. And uh, like if I'm sitting in the same room with you uh, and I try to go out, go to a website by typing its common name in it, say Twitter.com, uh, the path that my uh, packets you know might take to get me to that web page 
may be very, very different based on my mobile carrier versus yours. Uh, it may be traversing a V4 network purely. It may be traversing a V6 network purely. It may be hopping in and out of both. Uh, and often you never have to know about that. Most people don't even have to know how that really works. But if you're a developer and you're, you know, mission critical, uh, high, uh, high availability, low latency API endpoints, these are when you really need to start to worry about these types of things. So if somebody in China opens up softwareengineeringdaily.com on their mobile phone versus me opening up softwareengineeringdaily.com on, on my mobile phone, give me a picture for how those two experiences uh, might work at a lower level like what's going on in the routing infrastructure along the millions of internets uh, that is causing those domain names to both map to the same information okay so there's a couple of things one of the things that we do at dyne also is we monitor the internet with a, a product that we call internet intelligence and so we happen to know that on average Every packet, you know, from your device to the server you're trying to communicate to, um, you know, that, that, and there may be dozens of servers behind a particular web page, uh, there's on average about 13 hops. And that means there's 13, you know, public routers somewhere along the way. Some of those routers uh, might be uh, not performing very well. Some of those routers uh, might have small pipes associated with them. Some of those routers might take you through, uh, you know, proxies and firewalls. Uh, and which may induce packet loss or uh, certainly induce latency into it. So that's one thing that can happen is that you'll take a different path and the, the many different paths you take, uh, any one hop can be a problem area. And DNS can't solve that for you. That's that's a, a network you know, uh, monitoring level uh, consideration. Uh, but there's another consideration, which is we tend to think simply that oh I've got a I got a web server and I've got an IP address maybe I I leased an IP you know say I'm hosting it out of a a cloud provider and in a compute instance and I've been given a public IP so I've got a server I've got one IP if you're really uh, good with like uh, uh, tools like Nginx you know that you can host many different uh, servers or services uh, through the same uh, HTTP, HTTPS proxy, and that's just you know it's configuration issues. How well and good you are at configuring Nginx, but that's one IP. But it's also quite possible that you know that uh, if you've got one server, one IP, and that user's in China and your server's on the East Coast, they've got a long way to go uh, to get there. Uh, even though it still might be on average 13 hops, it's from the other side of the planet, and physics gets involved. The speed of light, you can only push you know packets so fast down a down a fiber optic uh, wire. Um, and if I'm on the East Coast, short path, I'm, t I'm probably going to get much better response time. Uh, so that's one level of consideration. Um, I'll introduce another term because I'm looking through uh, some of the notes and it's not there as any cast. So that single IP in V4 speak, that's a slash 32. Uh, it's a single address out of one of, poten of a potential of 4 billion addresses. And, and that's yours. Um, with any cast, um, you you have to widen it at, at a minimum for it to work on the internet to uh, what's called a slash twenty four in v four space. So two hundred fifty five potential addresses that you could communicate uh, to, uh, and then with any cast, you can uh, I tend to prefer uh, refer it to as uh, you can lie to the internet. You can say that you're in more than one place at the same time, uh, and so with any casting. You could have an Anycast edge that was very close to China, maybe in Taiwan or in uh, Tokyo or, or Seoul. And then if you've done that, you can do it with Unicast or Anycast. You could have two un Anycast, uh, two Unicast addresses, sorry, uh, uh, and have DNS steer you to the one that's closer. Or you could have any, a single Anycast address or what seems to be a single Anycast address. And the networking routing infrastructure will take you to the closest address. Uh, at Dyn, we're uh, very familiar with both of these techniques and we use them to manage our service. And our, our top customers run a, a, a hybrid of Anycast and unicasting on the public internet and allow us to provide naming over it. I think one way that we can look at DNS is... It's essentially a database. So anybody who is looking up a domain name is essentially accessing a database. And anybody who stands up a website is performing 
a insert on that database. You set up the website, you assign a domain name to it. This is this globally distributed database where anytime you enter a domain name in a browser or on a console or whatever, you get an IP address and you can do stuff with that IP address. So give me an idea for how that dis- big distributed database works. How are things propagated? How does an insert work? And how does an update work? How does a read work? Okay, well, that's a great set of questions. Um, so DNS has been around for a very long time. Uh, so it, you're right to refer to it as a database. Um, I would also go further to say it's an eventually consistent database. And in some ways, uh, with all of the rage that you know has been going on for the last 10 years or so around NoSQL, it is the sort of granddaddy of NoSQL <laughs> databases. Uh, and 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 I, I say that because it is. Um, and so, how does that work under the covers? You're right. So if I'm if my browser doesn't understand what uh, you know example.com is, it's going to have to use it. You know, make a DNS lookup. You know, which is a query. It's a read request. Uh, to, to find out what is the actual address of the of the server that I need to communicate to. Uh, that's going to communicate to the edge of a DNS provider's systems. Um, it could be your ISP. Um, it could be uh, Dyn itself. It could be one of our competitors. It could be um, something where you tend to talk to, uh, well, people think of Google as a, as a DNS provider, and they are. But there's two core differences or types of DNS uh, systems to get that answer in the first place. So the first is the recursive. So you, as an as internet provider, you must provide a recursive service to your, to your customers because otherwise they won't be able to get anywhere. Um, at Google, uh, and for many years, the, those uh, open recursives or the recursives that you would see, they weren't necessarily open. They might be closed just to your ISP. So for Comcast, uh, which is my uh, uh, home provider, they give me a recursive. I can communicate through it. You don't think much about it. Recursive is actually a cache. It's kind of like a CDN edge node in the sense that it's going to remember answers for a period of time. Uh, every DNS uh, record has a, a time to live associated with it, a TTL. And that, that recursive will find out the answer from an authority, um, cleverly called an authority, the master. Um, and that authority is the definitive place uh, where, uh, uh, where you can um, you know, store and manage your records as, as, a, as a user of DNS systems. You do not manage your records in a, in a recursive. So Google 8.8.8.8 uh, is, is one of Google's uh, well-known uh, any casted IP addresses globally. Uh, is is a recursive endpoint, and they allow you anybody to communicate through them. Uh, Dyn uh, and Oracle now we offer our own recur- open recursive. We have for many many years called Internet Guide, uh, and there are a number of others. In fact, there are thousands of open recursives on the internet that you can communicate through. They in turn go to the authority, and the authority is re- really where the um, the core of the DNS uh, master records are kept. Uh, that's typically going to be managed, you know, via an API or some form of a user interface. Uh, and as you make changes uh, to your records, um, they will be propagated out. Uh, well, they'll, they'll be available to be answered from the authority. Uh, I'll actually hold an, a deeper answer on how authorities are often structured and how we structure ours here. Uh, but the recursive, if it doesn't have it in the cache, it's going to hit the authority. Uh, and the authority is going to give up the answer for, like, for example, an A record, which is a, a V4 address. Um, mm-hmm. And you'll get that answer. The recursive uh, will hold it for its time to live, which is, you know, and in the past, time to lives were very long, you know, hours, maybe even days. Uh, in the modern Internet, time to lives uh, tend to be very short. Technically, they could be zero seconds, but in reality, on the uh, on the open internet, they they never really work when they're less than twenty or thirty seconds. Uh, and by having a short TTL, what you're allowing is the ability to fail over or load balance through DNS mechanisms to another point and location. Uh, the authority is the one that's going to tell the rec- recursive how long the answer is good for, and then the recursive is responsible for you know keeping its cache warm and and remembering that answer. Just like a CDN cache, however, it's uh, if there's a lot of traffic, you know, that cached answer might get, you know, flushed out of cache to answer the next set of, you know, 10,000 unique things that came along. 
Uh, and, and that's the art of, of running a recursive versus running an authority. Artificial intelligence is dramatically evolving the way that our world works. And to make AI easier and faster, we need new kinds of hardware and software, which is why Intel acquired Nirvana Systems and its platform for deep learning. Intel Nirvana is hiring engineers to help develop a full stack for AI, from chip design to software frameworks. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply for an opening on the team. To learn more about the company, check out the interviews that I've conducted with its engineers. Those are also available at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel. Come build the future with Intel Nirvana. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply now. Dyn has been around for a while, and you have grown in parallel with this growth of cloud infrastructure, the on-demand, you know, I can request a server from Amazon Web Services or Google. How is DNS different for the companies that are built on cloud infrastructure, this on-demand infrastructure, in contrast to the decades-old model of on-prem architectures? Um, another good question, and part of me wants to say there is no difference, uh, but th there are some subtle, very important working differences. Uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, if I was a, a company that had been around and now wanted to come onto the internet and had you know my own data center, had my own internet connectivity, my own slice of, of uh, you know address space, and that time it would have probably been V4 space, uh, I, I would control my domain name. Uh, and invariably, a lot of enterprises control uh, their their public you know facing internet uh, names through systems that they've had internally for many years. Microsoft Active Directory is a DNS server. Um, and and the, the DNS records that you might control for the inside of your organization, you could also control some of your publicly facing ones with, with systems like that. So you would have complete control over saying that address, you know, 192.168.32.41 is www.example.com. And I know that because I'm the operator of that address space, I'm the operator of the data center, I'm the operator of the server. Um, now let's sort of think about it from a cloud perspective. You spin up a compute instance uh, or a container with a public IP address and, and one of the cloud providers. Uh, you're going to be giving, uh, you know, typically two IPs, an internal IP that's useful maybe if you have some other hosts in the, in the same, uh, you know, VPN or, or something that you could communicate with. Um, but you're going to get a public IP. So you know the public IP address. At that space scenario, just with trying to map that public IP to an A record, it's no different than the enterprise scenario. But there's another thing that happens whenever a, a cloud provider spin up an instance for you. They typically will also create a DNS a name for that server that's accessible on the public internet. But it's going to be in their namespace. So you will get an Amazon-derived name. Uh, and if and, and you can... Uh, you could use that, but you've lost your brand if you care about your brand. It wouldn't say softwareengineeringdaily.com. It would say some very long random number dot, you know, amazon.com. <laughs> it's not exactly amazon.com, but I think you see my point. Uh, and so there's another type of um, DNS record you can use uh, to overlay that, a C name, uh, which is just a, a, an alias. So you could say, I want softwareengineeringdaily.com to be C named to that other address. Uh, the other name that was provided uh, from another domain name. Uh, DNS systems will then look up both of those uh, records whenever you're trying to resolve softwareengineeringdaily.com. Uh, and uh, your browser has a built-in stub resolver, and it will do that you know, work for you uh, and just help you know, the user get to the site that they're trying to get to. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that's a little bit different with clouds is, is the introduction of C names and you know whether you care to see you know put a C name in place over over the C name they've given you, um, uh, or uh, you know go right to the A record. That's that's your that's your choice, and you have you do have to think about it because there are you know sort of ramifications for that. One last point I'd say is that CDNs invariably also issue C names for you as well. 
Uh, and uh, so it's it's the same scenario. CDN is 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 doing the same type of uh, sort of slight obfuscation. If you know how DNS works and how to use some low level commands, you can figure out all of these chains and and where things really are. Um, but it's just a uh, sugar coating and, and wrappers to make it easy for for people to navigate and um, and get to where they're trying to get to. So in addition to the changes in how companies are setting up their infrastructure, that a lot of companies are doing it via the cloud because infrastructure as code makes things easier. Uh, there's you know, these economies of scale that AWS can offer makes it cheaper to run on the cloud for many businesses. Um, this is it's led to a dramatic increase in web traffic, and in, in addition to uh, mobile usage, and so the the fabric of the internet has changed, or at least the the density of traffic. Um, are there any second order effects that the DNS layer of the internet has uh, has undergone as this cloud stuff has uh, proliferated you know what what are the problems that can occur for an application in the age of the cloud that are related to DNS that were less likely to occur in the the times of on-prem being the prominent model um, one area that I can think of is is that how you start to solve or, or worry about high availability problems. Uh, if you're in a cloud, you're going to use a load balancer. Um, if you're on-premise and you had enough demand against your service, you're going to use a load balancer. Uh, those things aren't changing uh, really at all, conceptually. Um, but if you also want to uh, shape your traffic and be more available, now you need to be in multiple regions of a cloud or potentially multiple cloud providers. Um, a- any one cloud provider, you know, they, they're going to have to have very fat pipes coming in and out of them. And uh, one thing for both the DNS providers and for the cloud providers that's, I think, a little bit different than, say, 10, 15 years ago is that there's, um, there's this perception and there's a, obviously a certain reality to it that if you attack a cloud provider, um, you, can, you, you can create a big blast radius. If you can saturate the edge of a cloud provider or a specific... Um, load balancer, you know, for somebody's service, uh, you might actually be, you know, causing uh, congestion for all all of the neighbors. Some of us call this noisy neighbor problems, mm-hmm. uh, and and that's also related to virtual hosting and and with uh, you know VMs running on a on a host, uh, a noisy neighbor might take all the CPU cycles, um, or might you know take a lot of the disk I/O, and you might not get the throughput and performance that that you were looking for in your VM or your container. But the same thing is also true with the traffic management issues. So the cloud provider's edges attract uh, attract lots of traffic and potentially malicious traffic. DNS providers um, and they attract a lot of malicious traffic as well. Uh, with with the simple idea being that if you could impact us, you could um, impact um, you know a lot of people. Uh, so. Clouds and DNS providers, they, they, we have to invest significantly in, in DDoS management and mitigation and, and how we run our systems. Uh, and, and that gets to something I mentioned earlier, like any casting, um, making sure that you're available um, in, in, in many places on the Internet um, for your key service endpoints. And then using a combination of DNS and, and network announcements to shape when you need to do maintenance or where you want uh, traffic to go. Those are those are all new challenge uh, or challenges that have evolved dramatically over the past decade or so, uh, and for the simple case, you're kind of oblivious to this as somebody who's just spinning up, you know, a, a new API or a, a new application, uh, and you generally don't have to worry about it. But if you become successful, well, you're gonna generally start to have to worry about these types of things and, and shape your traffic, shape where you're answering from, shape where your services are endpointed from. Uh, if you're tra- if you're collecting information that has any privacy with it, you you might be obligated to operate some of your endpoints and and specifically in Europe, for example. Um, and a DNS system can help you uh, manage those complexities. When people think about load balancing or scaling up to respond to an increase in user traffic, they're typically 
thinking, at least from my point of view, they're thinking about, oh, I need to spin up more machines, more virtual machines, or, oh, I need to tell my load balancer to uh, spread the traffic among these things in a slightly different way. Uh, I'm not sure if as many people think about, oh, I should be having my DNS layer be changing how it does, uh, how it routes traffic, the DNS itself. So uh, when you're talking about using DNS as a way to respond to an increase in traffic, whether that's malicious or not, what exactly is going on at the DNS layer? Because I've got all these different knobs I can tune for my cloud infrastructure. I can mess with the load balancer. I can mess with, uh, you know, setting up more servers. And as you're saying with DNS, I can change the routing of my traffic. How am I looking at these different options as my service is undergoing an increase in load or an increase in failures? So now, now we're getting into advanced DNS use cases and advanced load balancing use cases, and and they they work together with each other. So you're right. I've I've got more demand on my service. I need to spin up more compute um, or bigger instances because of the I/O or the network uh, uh, bandwidth needs that I have. Um, but correspondingly, you also might need to be spinning up and doing some DNS load balancing and and traffic shaping or traffic management. So let, let's give a simple example. Uh, if uh, BGP networks, uh, Border Gateway Protocol, which sort of binds the routers of the internet together, um, they're always going to prefer uh, sort of the, the, the shortest top. And uh, what, what does that mean? It means that if I'm on the East Coast and I ask um, uh, a question to going towards, like, for example, our DNS edge, uh, the shortest path would, prob- from where I am, would take me to, to USC, somewhere on the East Coast. Uh, if I was on the West Coast, the shortest path would take me to some one of our data centers on the West Coast, provided we've, of course, managed all of our BGP announcements correctly. Uh, and the same thing would, you know, sort of span the globe. And on average, you know, DNS providers have six or seven global regions, uh, just like the clouds have six or seven global, you know, areas of the planet, you know, that, that they break things up into. Uh, and you can keep your traffic locally within that. And, and often that is enough and was enough, to, say, 10 years ago to do the first generation of, of, of traffic management, keeping answers close to where the users are asking the questions. Um, that's one way of, you know, that's just one technique. Um, but then uh, then the next technique is, well, but yes, I've, I'm in the region, but I've got four endpoints that can serve all of my traffic. Then you can start to do, well, load balancing, round robin load balancing. So just like you can round robin load balance and a, and a load balancer that's picking which compute node to send uh, work towards, you can round robin load balance in the DNS system. And we will just randomly pick one of the four uh, potential uh, V4A records and give that up as an answer. But you can also weight them. Uh, and so I know I'm biasing towards a certain one of those nodes, and that's the one I want to send the traffic towards. Because, because as the operator, you might know, well, two of those four nodes are really big load balancer, you know, load balanced infrastructures, and the other two are, they're really for failover and or, and or fallback, and I only want traffic to go there 10% of the time. And those are the types of things that we let you uh, configure into, into your announce or answer strategy. Going back to our discussion of what's changed since the days of mostly on-prem software companies, you know, we've gone from this time where a website request would be served by just a server, and then we had servers hosting multiple VMs. I mean, we still have that. Uh, And then there's some increased layer of redirection that goes on there, and then more recently, we've got the widespread use of containers. So a, a single VM might host a bunch of containers. Have the roles of a DNS provider significantly changed with these increased layers of infrastructure on the same physical server? That's a great question on a couple of layers. So on one level, no. It just creates all the more need for you to use a third-party DNS provider so that you can have better control over uh, naming and where you want things to go. Um, but there's sort of a flip side to that answer. And it gets to something I, I didn't mention earlier. I did mention about IPv4 and v6 and, and carving up uh, address space. And I talked about basic traffic management you know, using any cast sort of first hop, you know, take me to the closest thing. Um, but 
you, you can't do that without knowing IP address space. So some people talk about GeoDNS or, or you know, being geo-aware. So we, we have uh, a number of different ways to do this in our DNS systems. But the Internet and IP numbers aren't geo. They're just numbers. And so you end up in, you can end up in the following scenario. I, I, I'm a company. I managed to get from Aaron uh, some address space. Uh, and I, you know, work with my, you know, my network providers to be able to announce, you know, servers in that address space. And it's registered to my company. And my company is in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, yet my servers may not be in Boston, Massachusetts at all. Uh, and say I had a, uh, a slash 24 I mentioned is the smallest block that you can announce on the public internet. Say I had two slash 24s. Um, so that's a slash 23 in uh, sort of network notation. Um, you might think that I'd had those two blocks in, in, in Boston because that's what the records would say in the, in the registration databases. But in fact, I may have chosen to split one of those blocks to serve the West Coast and another block to serve the East Coast. So now, how do you know that one of those 512 addresses, where is it on the Internet? That's another underlying layer of, uh, of our DNS systems is understanding the geolocation of an IP address so that we can do very fine-grained staring, um, both of where the user's coming from or the resolver that they came through um, or where, where we're targeting you, know, you to get to. And, and that's, uh, as I say it in words, I, I, I wonder out loud, like how, how that's a hard thing to comprehend if you don't know some of the moving parts. Um, but it's, uh, it's core to this is that understanding like how to carve up just those 4 billion, you know, V4 addresses and know where they are and know that they change. Um, so here's a, a great example, uh, core internet transit, you know, bandwidth providers, like say a company like level three, this is a sort of a classic case that we talk about with our internet intelligence product. Uh, they're, they're like a backbone provider in the internet. And they have two adjacent, you know, uh, addresses. Um, yet those adjacent addresses might be at physically at the end of, of a piece of fiber optic, one in Miami, another one in Sao Paulo. Um, so you can't even assume that two adjacent Internet numbers um, are anywhere, you know, loca- you know, geographically close to each other. We have internal databases within our DNS database that helps us understand this and continuously track these types of uh, uh, nuances as to where an IP is, uh, because that helps us steer the traffic right where you know our, our customer's policy wants wants the traffic to go to. We talked about how DNS works with a simple website like softwareengineeringdaily.com. It's more interesting to talk about what happens with DNS on a complex site with a lot of different things going on, like SoundCloud or Etsy or just these big companies. They have massive infrastructure. That infrastructure is always under a lot of load. Give a description for why the DNS requirements of a company like SoundCloud might be different from the requirements of something like softwareengineeringdaily.com? Well, I think it's a combination of all of the things I've just been talking about, which is the how many endpoints do you, uh, are, are you, uh, can you afford to stand up on the public internet, for one? Uh, are they going to be geographically dispersed? Are they going to be concentrated in a particular region? Um, if they're concentrated in a region, are you going to have multiple uh, sort of item potent endpoints that it doesn't matter which one you go to, they can do the same amount of work? Um, uh, are you trying to serve static content, uh, CDNs? They, they do all of the things we're describing as well. Uh, these are the advanced techniques. So I guess I was sort of answering your, your, your last question um, with some, some of my partial answers earlier. You bring all of this together, geolocation, round robining, load balancing, short TTLs. Uh, short TTLs allow you to uh, you know, be resilient uh, under duress. You can shift traffic to somewhere else when there's a failure and, and you're your, you know, your your downtime might be uh, very minimal, if, n- if none, uh, depending on uh, how you might have given overlapping answers or you've you've limited the number of uh, small number of users who may temporarily not be able to get to you. The great thing with most browsers and applications is they'll automatically retry. Uh, so if they couldn't get that connection, uh, the TTL short, 
It's going to go get another address. It's going to retry the connection. Uh, and, you know, sort of Bob's your uncle. You can move along and, uh, and, and get to where you were trying to get to. These collection of techniques are, are core to what our services are offering and, and core to what keeps some of the biggest sites on the Internet up all the time. Hmm. You mentioned a term there, short TTL. Can you give more color on what that means? Um, okay, so a short TTL would say how long that record is, is valid for. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if I'm doing a, a active load balancing... Just time, to, also time mo- to live. Time to live. And, and so... Uh, uh, CDNs also have a similar thing, which is like a, a ca- uh, the caching uh, headers of how long the, the content can be cached in the browser or cached in a proxy that was between the originator of the content and, and the final recipient of it. Same idea with DNS. DNS sort of predates uh, these notions. And um, the shorter the TTL, the more queries that will get you know a- asked over all of the people you know asking the questions uh, spread across the Internet. Um, but it gives you the ability to sort of uh, heal, you know, the system or heal your service uh, and provide another place where you might steer users to. Uh, so rather than, uh, you know, just sort of round robining and picking, you know, one of four addresses, you could also add an overlay of monitoring. And that's another thing that we do um, with our advanced DNS services is we will actively monitor, just like you might use a variety of monitoring services uh, uh, to See what your health of your endpoint is, and can a user get to your end, you know, get to your website or get to your API? Um, that monitoring can get very sophisticated. Can they actually log in? Can they can they perform a transaction, um, uh, etc.? Mm. Um, and you're probably using that to trigger, you know, uh, an alerting system because you you know and, and get you know trigger a pager, you know, or what whatnot, and so that you somebody can you know. Uh, get involved and mitigate, you know, the reason that, you know, the monitoring is firing off an alert. In the case of the monitoring that's embedded into our DNS service, we'll adjust answers based on health of target endpoints. So you might say, I've I've got four things to choose from. I want you to, you know, you, you know, Dyne to actively monitor those endpoints. And if one goes down, take it out of the answer pool. So even though it could around robin between four, if we see that two are down, it's only going to round robin between two, uh, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a it's a combination of uh, that's perhaps the most advanced uh, technique that you could use uh, or policy that you could uh, define against your your answer set. So I, I want to zoom in on this TTL term a little bit more because TTL implies that there is an entry somewhere. And that entry is eventually going to expire once the TTL expires. So a TTL is a broad term in software engineering where you write an entry to some kind of record, a database, or a cache, or anything. And the TTL specifies how long is this entry valid for. Once it's invalid, it expires, and it's no longer going to be used. And so maybe it gets refreshed somehow, or... It makes a query to get a new record with a new TTL. But when you say you're, there's, you're creating an entry somewhere with some sort of TTL, where exactly are you referring to? Are you referring to, is this a, an entry in, in a, a CDN or is it an entry in uh, the DNS provider's database somewhere? Give, give a little more color on that. Okay. Um, so I did talk about both CDNs and, and DNS records or uh, CDN content and DNS answers having TTLs because okay. they both do. Right. But CDNs are also depending upon DNS TTLs um, to deliver you to their endpoint that's going to deliver you the content. So that's potentially a little confusing. In the end, though, it's when I mentioned earlier, there's a recursive and there's an authority. Uh, we happen to operate both. Um, but uh, primarily, you know, we're an authority. Uh, within the authorities, within our database, um, under the covers, we'll have something called, well, we'll have a master database. And in our case, it is a database. Um, and the records that are in your zone, exam- for, I'll just keep using example.com, I'll have a record for www.example.com. Mm-hmm. And the www record would say it's an A record, it's got an address, and it's got a TTL. Um, and it's up to you, the configurer of that record, to decide, you know, what those values are. Um, and the, the, the important one is a TTL. If you set that to, uh, you know, 12 hours and you've only got one of those and then your server goes down, 
no matter what, it's going to be 12 hours that that record is valid. Um, and your server will never be reachable for somebody who already obtained a cached version of that answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but if I come on and I haven't been on the system uh, and, and gone to that, you know, example dot dot example dot com uh, and it's the first time I'm trying to go, my browser cache will be empty. Um, it will go get the answer. And but if it's the only answer still, it's just going to take me to a dead server mm. uh, or a server that's not responding. So the shorter the TTL, the more control, fine grained control you have over ensuring that you can steer uh, somebody who's trying to get to you, mm-hmm. you know, to, to, to wherever you're healthy. Right. So if I'm example.com and my site is really picking up in a lot of popularity and I've started to add in all kinds of load balancers and, uh, you know, I'm connected to Am- Amazon Web Services. So a lot of my, my, you know, VMs are dying all the time and things are being restarted. I'm going to want a very short TTL on the entry that is associated with www.example.com. Correct. And the shorter the TTL, the more control you have over it. But but there's a, you know, there, you get more QPS. QPS doesn't cost a lot in general. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I would not advise people to worry about that. And if they are, talk to us. We can, uh, we can talk to you about, you know, things to consider when you're doing that. Now, I also talked about the master where you're setting, you know, those records up. Uh, our masters um, are, are never the thing that faces the Internet. So we, this is something that you asked me about earlier and I didn't answer uh, at this next level that I'm going to go into. So a DNS edge for a provider like ourselves is always a master slave edge. And nobody on the public Internet can get to our masters because uh, they're the definitive source of truth. And as a change propagates into them, the master sends a special sort of fire and forget one-time message that it's it's called the notify that notifies its slaves that it knows about um, that, hey, there's a change to the zone. And then the slave can either get a full or partial transfer. So that's sort of a full or partial replica. Uh, You know, maybe just the delta is sufficient, just the one record might, you know, propagate to the slave or... In certain circumstances, the the entire zone might have to be propagated. And it's the slaves that, um, and we have many hundreds of slaves out there on the Internet, that those are the ones that the recursives actually talk to. So DNS under the covers actually has a replication protocol designed into it. And we use that DNS-based replication protocol to get the answers to slaves and our goal over time is always to get slaves ever closer to to customers or to cloud endpoints or to cdn infrastructure so that we can give high you know response in those scenarios um and there's a separate replication tier that's under the covers that's database replication and and i think many of your listeners will be familiar with what you can do with mysql or postgres or other databases uh, and how they replicate internally that would all be private replication traffic and in our case it's private replica traffic as well Hmm. we're getting into why a dns provider is actually useful because i can go to any number of sites that can offer me really cheap hosting and they're going to take care of mapping my domain name to an IP address. They're going to host my website, uh, particularly if it's a WordPress site on some uh, container that's dedicated to hosting WordPress sites. And um, I can get DNS just with that. So why would I want a company like Dyn that's entirely devoted to doing DNS? Well, I think it's for all of the, the uh, some people might say they're edge cases, um, but they're actually pretty common, uh, scenarios that we were just describing. You've got more than one endpoint, uh, and you don't want it to be randomly selected. Say you had two endpoints, one in uh, Europe and, and one in Singapore. Do you want to send 50% of your North American users to to Singapore to talk to your server? No. Um, So typically what you're going to get with the sort of built-in free DNS is the very basic answering. Uh, Single records, single values, or in the case of, you know, you can have multiple values for an A record. Just, you know, pure round robin. No waiting, no load balancing, no geo-awareness, no monitoring. All of those things... 
uh, n- now becomes something that you 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 need to to consider. Um, and if if you're making money from your your service, which I hope everybody is, uh, you you need to keep that up. You need to to ensure that you're delivering ads. Um, if it's you know a blog type of thing, um, you need to be able to ensure that you're you know getting a customer all the way through checkout. Um, if you're doing e-commerce, etc. Uh, and that's where it becomes critical. Uh, you know, we're dedicated to surviving and, and, and dealing with sort of all of the things that happen on the Internet um, and, and ensuring that we can give the best answer possible for, for the question that's being asked, which is, how do I get to this site? Ready to build your own stunning website? Go to Wix.com and start for free. With Wix, you can choose from hundreds of beautiful, designer-made templates. Simply drag and drop to customize anything and everything. Add your text, images, videos, and more. Wix makes it easy to get your stunning website looking exactly the way that you want. Plus, your site is mobile-optimized, so you'll look amazing on any device. Whatever you need your website for, Wix has you covered. So showcase your talents. Start that dev blog detailing your latest projects. Grow your network with Wix apps made to work seamlessly with your site. Or simply explore and share new ideas. You decide. Over 100 million people choose Wix to create their website. What are you waiting for? Make yours happen today. It's easy and free. And when you're ready to upgrade, use the promo code SEDAILY for a special SE Daily listener discount. Terms and conditions apply. For more details, go to www.wix.com slash wix-lp slash se daily. Create your stunning website today with wix.com. That's wix.com. If I'm an engineer at a site that uses a DNS provider, I'm going to want to set policies for how my traffic is going to be routed in response to changing conditions, what are some common strategies for setting policies? Uh, I'm glad you use the term policy as well because that that's my preferred term because it is policy. It, it, when you're configuring these types of services, you're really configuring policy. And what, what are the criteria by which a particular policy will be applied? So we will have policies for you know health, for performance, reachability, um, waiting um, uh, the policy around the TTL you could even think of as a policy. Um, and those are the things that you start to uh, get uh, get control over. Um, also notification policy, no, being notified that there was a problem with your server or that we just we detected that we needed to steer around a, a connection problem. Um, the other thing I'd say is is the following. I, I've given a talk publicly a couple of times. That wasn't so much about DNS, but DNS was is, is part of the story. Um, so I remember the day with one of these early clouds where you know I was in a, a different company and I thought that you know spending a, a hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand dollars a month uh, uh, with with the provider was was an awful lot of money. Uh, but at that point, when you spent a hundred thousand dollar in hosting, you know you had somebody to talk to um, if there was a problem with your services. Um, but that day is sort of long gone with some of the clouds. And uh, we had a, a customer of ours, uh, both a DNS customer and a, a customer of our monitoring uh, uh, products, uh, whose data center or services uh, running in, in the Far East uh, suddenly you know, had super high latencies. Effectively, they were off the Internet. And it was because of a cable cut. Um, and, uh, but it, how do you figure out there's a cable cut and who calls you? How do you know that you're suddenly having a performance degradation mm. and that your DNS steering needs to kick in and, and get, you know, is answering differently because of the, uh, the thresholds you provided on the monitoring. So one could be like, if you don't see an answer in less than 500 milliseconds on the monitor, send it to, you know, the, the, the host that's responding in less than 500 milliseconds. That is the type of policy that, that we can, uh, help our customers achieve. Uh, and this customer was spending over a million dollars a month. Uh, and so I, I titled the talk four Ferraris and a, pa- a cable cut <laughs> because they were basically spending four Ferraris a month in hosting and got a cable cut. They were effectively off the internet. And how do they know? Who, who do you call? Hmm. 
Uh, and then the cable cut isn't the cloud provider's problem. That's something that's happened external to them. So this there's a collection of services and cap- capabilities here um, that that you're you're buying when you when you opt into a, you know a dedicated DNS provider. What's the relationship between DNS and my monitoring infrastructure? Is there some way to leverage DNS when I'm trying to get better insights uh, for how my infrastructure is performing monitoring wise? So I, I'd say two ways. So one, I've been saying one thing I have been saying is that you know we provide advanced monitoring as part of some of our advanced DNS policy capabilities, and. And we we do that, and we don't charge for that separately. So that's not like a it's not it's like a loss leader almost. We need to provide that capability, but we also consume the very same third party monitoring systems that our customers also depend upon uh, to understand and run their dashboards. Like how well is my service providing, or how many you know page views am I getting, or am I seeing you know 500 errors out of my web servers. And we're using those same monitoring uh, services to monitor ourselves. So it's kind of a meta-monitoring problem. Uh, we need to monitor how well we're doing. And we invariably use the same uh, monitoring, more than one monitoring system, because our customers use more than one third-party monitoring system. Because we need to see ourselves from the way the customer sees ourselves, or sees our service uh, being provided. Uh, so I'd say you need... To use both and uh, to, to to the level and extent that you can, um, and uh, always use monitoring no matter what. Otherwise, you are going to be flying blind. You will not know how things are are going. You won't know that your know, host may be up, but it might not be responding because the process is down. To it's responding, but it's responding like you know once a second instead of ten thousand times a second, et cetera. You need to know you know when. Uh, latency is being induced in your services. You need to know that you're staring around those problems if that's the policy you've configured. Uh, and uh, third-party monitoring systems are, are, are another tool in, in your tool belt that you need. Hmm. What role does a DNS provider play in the event of a DDoS attack or another catastrophic event? Um, well, ideally, uh, we we will isolate you from an aspect of it. Um, now, if if it really depends on what the there's there, there's not any type single type of of DDoS attack out there. Um, as many people are aware that there's a, a whole a uh, lot of talk about the IoT and Internet of Things or Internet of Bad Things or uh, uh, I uh, sort of heard uh, Internet of uh, S you know, swear word <laughs> things you know uh, at a conference last week. Um, it's a great and, it's a great Twitter account by the way. There's, they've got some hilarious. Uh, memes and stuff coming out of that Twitter account, and and so it depends. I mean, marshalling so for literally just a few dollars, you can buy a device that you know properly connected to the internet can generate a tremendous amount of traffic. And if you've got thousands of those devices uh, that have been compromised in one form or another, you 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 have a you know a, a weapon of mass destruction, or certainly a weapon of you know, I can perform and send a lot of packets. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're sending packets towards a DNS provider um, in the effort to try to, if you take us down um, and, and thereby, you know, creating a blast radius around us and all of our customers, okay, great. We, we're we we're under um, some form of elevated, you know, packets every single day. Um, and, and, and we're you generally very good at, at shedding that traffic and uh, and dealing with it, but that botnet could also be targeting a specific single IP address. And once you do that, you're not going through DNS um, at all. Um, and, and we're just sort of a witness to, to to the same thing that others might be witnessing, which could be congestion over a particular pipe, and we don't know why. Uh, so you've got to have those defenses in your system. So the way I would talk about that is defense in depth. Um, because we uh, provide services to cloud providers and operate some of our services in cloud providers themselves, uh, we we always in our core data centers we're always operating effectively a private cloud on the public internet. Uh, so we defend in transit um, because we can, and and most people have no ability to even you know know who who, who to work with to do that. If you're in a cloud provider and hosting a you know compute instance, or you've spun up a container in a container service, 
you're dependent upon the cloud providers network engineering team to to defend for you um so that's one level of defense is within the transit itself upstream from you know your router routing edge then routers your your routing edge itself is a second tier of defense um again if you're running in a cloud provider and you you know your cloud providers providing that capability for you uh, because you don't have access to that. I've gone to a lot of DevOps and monitoring conferences over the past few years. And one of the questions I kind of like to ask is, you know, who who knows what BGP is? Um, And invariably, I'll get just a tiny subset of the audience will even know that BGP is a protocol that actually makes the Internet go. Um, And then some, you know, it's a much larger percentage of the audience knows what DNS is. But if you want to talk about Docker or, you know, all of the latest things in the DevOps and, and, and development world, they'll know that. And then they'll, of course, want to bicker about which is the best framework or whatever. Um, but some of the fundamentals of what make it go, they don't know. And so if you're doing your own routing, you know, you, you're going to have to know how to manage BGP and defend in your routing infrastructure. The next layer is your hosts. So if the traf, if it's a big cloud provider and, you know, they don't care that your host receives a gigabit or five gigabits of traffic because, um, you know, you're paying for the right to get the traffic delivered to you. But that that might be uh, traffic that you don't want or it is attack traffic. It's a sin attack. You know, it's a it's like a, a one type of an attack where um, you're trying to just, you know, fake the setup of a TCP session. You're going to have to defend that with how you configure your host you know, the kernel level configurations um, and or, you know, and if you're in a container service, you're not even having much of a control over that. And then lastly, the fourth layer of defense is within your processes themselves. Are you seeing a level of traffic? Are you rate limiting? Are you delivering 420s or 429s because, you know, somebody's calling your API too frequently? Uh, Each layer has its own, you know, sort of set of obligations and and capabilities if you want to keep that service up. Uh, and for how we operate, we, we defend in each of those layers and have a, you know, sort of tightly integrated, you know, sort of, uh, you know, chat, chat ops, you know, style services and integrated with that. Um, and you're going to have to build those same things into your container based services or your host based services. As we draw to a close, you know, we talked about the uh, Internet of Things as a as an annoyance or a threat vector. But there's also lots of opportunity in the Internet of Things. Of course, in some ways, we're already there with with our smartphones. Like, we've got so many devices that are connected to the Internet, but there's going to be so many more, whether we're talking about drones or connected cars or sensors everywhere. And with this growth in devices, there's going to be a growth in need for addressability of all these devices. How is that going to change the story for engineers who are building these things? And how is it going to change the story for the DNS providers? So uh, this was part of a number of discussions I was involved in last week at a conference. And so earlier I talked about V4 space. And um, V4 technically has about 4 billion addresses. And it was a number of years ago that it seemed like we were about to run out of V4 space. And there was some doom and gloom among a, a small group of folks who worry about this on the Internet. Uh, and, th- and it's a legitimate concern, and it's a pressure to use V6, which has a much more, a much larger address space for you. Um, but the funny thing is, is that one of the data points I saw last week was that there's over 20 billion devices that people have been able to fingerprint that are operating on the quote-unquote V4 Internet. Well, how could that be? Well, it's because the vast majority of, of devices are natted. And they're they're behind a, a you know a, a, a network address translation be, behind a, a firewall of of some sort, and so they're not directly addressable um, from the internet. Um, yet they can reach the internet, do things, communicate things out. So I think the first thing I'd ask you to think about is, do you need to push or pull? And and a lot of IoT things and a lot of um, data flow models have shifted towards push. That, which means you you know from behind that NAT you can establish the connection to the service endpoint that you want to deliver to, and you you can stream once that connection's set up, um, and so for example you could uh, have a, an IoT video camera whose design said yes you must open your firewall up uh, on your home router, 
and you must uh, allow connectivity to that and and then you can use this app and it's going to let you watch you know your dog or your baby or 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 your your car or whatever you want to watch it you know that that's somewhere else um or you could say no no we have an app and what's going to be happening is the the other side you know on the device on the other side of the net is going to be polling and until you suddenly want it really to give you the information it's nearly not going to do anything but now it's going to push and push as much data as it needs to so you can you can get away with that um and and not sort of run out of uh, you know the need for direct addressability has been uh, has been proven to be wrong and and v4 continues to to still survive um the same thing is true with V6. Um, uh, but when V6 was being designed, which was well over 20 years ago, it was in a day and age um, where everything that was on the Internet was on the Internet and you needed to directly reach it because that was kind of the point. But uh, there's lots of uh, things have happened over the last couple of decades that have taught people that, well, maybe not everything should be on the Internet directly. Um and, and we have to put layers of protection in place. And so that push-pull, you know, I think is, has saved us uh, uh, the exhaustion of the V4 address space and allowed a lot more devices to, to come to be uh, that are solving some, you know, problems that people really want to have solved for themselves and how they, you know, live and, you know, run their lives in this modern age. Phil, thanks so much for coming on Software Engineering Daily. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again to Symphono for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily for almost a year now. Your continued support allows us to deliver this content to the listeners on a regular basis. Wow!